Every year it gives me great pleasure to welcome a, a distinguished speaker to honor Alex. And uh, this year we, I thought it would be very topical to talk about pandemic influenza. Um, there's been a lot in the news and a lot of concern and continues to be a lot of activity in this arena. And it became very clear very soon that the person to invite was Bob Couch. Dr. Couch uh, has been director of the Influenza Research Center at Baylor since 1974. It's now been evolving into a, a respiratory pathogens research center. And it was invited to be part of the WHO team that went to southern China to evaluate the foul flu, as it's been called already today. Um, he's, over the years, been a member of many advisory committees to NIH, to the Armed Forces Epidemiologic Board, uh, the National Vaccine Advisory Committee, and a, a list of things that uh, goes on and on. And, and I didn't want to carry his CV up here because of the number of publications. It was too large. Uh, rather than spend a lot of time, he asked me to be brief and let him come and spend a few extra minutes talking about pandemic flu. Bob Couch. Thank you, Dr. Thacker, and uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, present the Alex Langmuir address to this distinguished group today. I uh, know Dr. Langmuir from uh, committee meetings, from workshops, from uh, visits to uh, tour our center and discuss research in Houston. And certainly, uh, Dr. Malar characterized him correctly when he talked about this very powerful, very strong, epidemiologically oriented person. He clearly dominated the majority of the meetings in which I was in attendance, and uh, it's, a, it's appropriate that, uh, that he be honored at these sessions. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that Dr. Langmuir spent a great deal of time on during his career was concerns for influenza. Some of you may, recommend this, may, may recollect this cartoon, and it was uh, representing 1957 Asian epidemic. And this presumably would be Dr. Langmuir, who thought after the first wave of influenza had gone through that it was safe to get out on the lake. Well, you can see that it wasn't safe to get out on the lake because a second wave descended, and it descended much larger than the first wave. Actually, Paul Gleason and I, Paul is one of your EIS alumni, I have the same recollection that there is a different cartoon in which Dr. Langmuir is speaking to the press and he is predicting that there will be no second wave while this second wave is over the top of his head about to descend on him. Now, the, the point of that is not to be disparaging of Dr. Langmuir, but to emphasize that influenza is unpredictable. It was unpredictable in 1957, and it is largely unpredictable again today. And so that's one of the concerns that we have as we address this subject. What I'm going to do is spend just a few minutes first on the background of influenza, just to bring everybody up to the same background of information to talk about this subject. And then I want to spend a few minutes on interpandemic influenza. We put a lot of effort there, and it justifies that and then address the topic that I was asked to speak on, and that's namely pandemic influenza. And if you'll permit me, I prefer the term chicken flu. Foul flu just doesn't sound quite right to me. <laughs> All right, this is the causative agent, an electron micrograph of influenza virus and a schematic showing the major structural parts. A great deal is known about this virus, probably perhaps as much or more than of any other of the human viruses. Here's the internal nucleoprotein, uh, nucleocapsid core. The nucleoprotein is a stable antigen, and that has defined the influenza types. They are type A, type B, and type C. There are two major types of surface units, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. Hemagglutinin because it hemagglutinates red cells. Neuraminidase promotes the infection process through mucus and release from cells. Most of the action of what goes on with influenza is contained in those two, uh, those two molecules. Now this just summarizes the major features of influenza. The major cause, the influenza A and B viruses. The influenza C viruses are caught up as a cause of minor respiratory disease, occasional outbreaks in young individuals. They characteristically exhibit antigenic variation with time, and that 
anagenic variation with time explains the epidemiologic behavior. Influenza causes annual epidemics involving all age groups and periodic pandemics are primary subject for consideration. The clinical disease is an acute respiratory illness with some characteristic symptoms, sudden onset, fever, headache, cough, and muscle aches, with a significant risk of secondary bacterial disease, which is in the interpandemic era, the major cause for death associated with influenza. The medical problem is loss of productivity, individuals who miss school and work because of the illness, and medical care cost that comes from clinic visits, hospitalizations, and death, and death primarily occurring in elderly individuals and those with a number of high-risk conditions that increase their likelihood of death, particularly heart and lung disease. We have both a vaccine and we have drugs to treat the disease with at the present time. Now, considering the epidemiologic behavior and the antigenic variation as its basis, there are two types of variation that have been described for influenza A. Antigenic shift is the major change, and in this case, the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase are antigenically distinguishable in HAI tests, hemagglutination inhibition tests. There's no serologic relationship between them. When that occurs, the total population susceptibility may result, or a huge proportion of them. When it spreads, high attack rates occur in all age groups with a major increase in deaths. That's the circumstance for pandemic influenza. Antigenic drift or minor change occurs continuously for both the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase in which in standardized anosir there are cross reactions in hemagglutination inhibition tests between these two indicating antigenic relationships to previous strains. Because of this change a portion of the population is continuously re becomes re re renewed susceptibility is, occurs and, a, and a, an attack rate will occur that is variable but excess deaths are common. And that characterizes, characterizes the two major forms of epidemiologic behavior of influenza. Now that's taken into account with the classification and you'll see some of these names, numbers. Classification of human influenza viruses, type A, B, and C. We're not gonna dwell on C as we've indicated. Subtypes are restricted to type A and the first one that was discovered was in the isolations of swine in 1931, humans in 1933, and hence it's called number one and the neuraminidase number one. And the serologic responses in individuals who were living at the time indicated that the virus of this type caused 1918 influenza. Asian influenza occurred in 1957 with a total difference in the, both the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase in 1968, a change in the hemagglutinin, not in the neuraminidase for Hong Kong influenza. In 1977, H1N1 virus reappeared as what's known as the Russian flu, and a great deal of the whole population was, re, was resistant. The virus was exactly like a 1950 virus, and it has, while it is a new subtype, did not cause what would be called pandemic influenza and yet continues to circulate in populations at present. Influenza B does not exhibit subtypes. Within these subtype eras, there's that continuous minor drift we were talking about, and these are kept up with by representative variants. For example, A Hong Kong 1 for 68, a large number of variants have occurred since that time, and the most current one, A Sydney 597. This are, is, explains what's going on with it when we have interpandemic influenza, and these are the changes that explain pandemic influenza. Now let's take a few minutes to consider interpandemic influenza. We spent a great deal of time studying the subject in Houston. An epidemic occurs annually. That now is very clear. The magnitude of the epidemic, however, as we've indicated, varies, although in the northern hemisphere it occurs almost routinely between November and March. Influenza A viruses cause about two-thirds of the epidemics, influenza B about a third, and occasional epidemic will be mixed influenza A and influenza B. We established a surveillance network in Houston in 1974 when the Influenza Research Center that was referred to was created, and it was designed to quantitatively measure the impact of influenza in a community. We were fortunate to be able to hire one of your alumni, Paul Gleason, to direct that program after it was established, and he did a beautiful job. 
of developing the epidemiology of influenza in the community. We made a, developed a quantitative basis for it with sampling of individuals who were presenting to physicians' offices and clinics throughout the year with fever and respiratory symptoms. You can see the typical peak and trough for the winter and summer occurring every year, and you'll also note that in coinciding with each of these peaks is an influenza epidemic. Some A, some B, some large, some small. That's the variation that characterizes interpandemic influenza. Now, you can take one of those epidemics and characterize it in detail. This is the cleanest one, although they all follow generally a similar pattern. The virus enters the community as it increases, not shown on here, but off the top up here somewhere, is an increase in school absenteeism, an increase in emergency visits, pneumonia admissions to pediatric services, as these epidemics generate primarily among school children. In the latter half of the epidemic, you'll see again what's not off the curve here, of an increase in industrial absenteeism, an increase in pneumonia admissions to adult services, and an increase in pneumonia influenza mortality, and when the virus disappears from the community, all of the parameters come back to baseline. Well, you take that kind of data and studies that we were doing elsewhere, and we were able to profile an average influenza epidemic in that interpandemic era. And these are the figures that we provide. Estimated rates for influenza virus infection, 330 per thousand per person per year. That data was developed with a set of families studied longitudinally under Dr. Larry Tabor's direction. It consisted primarily of young adults and children, so it's probably a little bit on the high side but the true figure for the entire population would not be much lower than that. About two-thirds of them are ill. About half of those illnesses are significant enough to cause those individuals to seek health care. About 1% of them will be hospitalized, and a roughly 10% will die in association with influenza. You can take that kind of number, and we did at that time, and just re-express it as not figures of cases. And that would give us an estimated 82 million infections, 65 million illnesses, 30 million medically vis medical visits, 300,000 hospitalizations, and 25,000 deaths. The estimate from CDC was 20,000 deaths. And as I've indicated, I think these are a little bit on the high side. But on the other hand, the population is bigger now than it was earlier. The influenza continues as a major medical problem and these may be closer to the true figures we're experiencing today. As a result of that kind of information being developed, this was the conclusion of the Institute of Medicine report on vaccine priorities for this country. Human influenza constitutes the highest disease burden of all of the infectious diseases in the USA. Clearly it deserves much more, probably much, probably much more emphasis than it currently gets in efforts to control. Now, that, that's my soapbox for you. Now let's move on to the subject that I was asked to address, and that's pandemic influenza and the chicken flu problem. Epidemiologic history of, of epidemic influenza summary. Human history dates epidemics to ancient Greece. There's debate on how many of these are clearly follow the influenza pattern, but it seems highly likely that that's the case. They have occurred continuously since. Pandemics, which clearly occurred in, over, the, over the centuries, are difficult to document and separate from epidemics, but the first one for which there is absolutely no question occurred in 1889, and the others we've alluded to, 1918, 1957, and 1968. 1918 influenza, as well known, was the most devastating disease epidemic in history caused by any infectious disease. A moment of digression, again reminded because of our, the person we're honoring today, Dr. Langmuir. In his twilight years, he was still concerned with influenza and wrote a hyp hypothesis editorial in the New England Journal titled the Thucydides Syndrome. And the plague of Athens had taken place in 430 to 427 BC where thousands of individuals died, the army was weakened, and the Peloponnesian War was lost to, to Athens. Thucydides described the epidemic, which originated 
in the Middle East, and Dr. Langmuir proposed that it was acute influenza with a significant frequency of secondary staphylococcal infections and toxic sex shock syndrome, and influenza is on that list of infectious diseases that affects history. I did not reread this, but my original thought at the time, I guess I would repeat to you, was plausible. Not convincing, unfortunately, but a plausible hypothesis. But it does represent, again, Dr. Langmuir's uh, innovative thinking. Now let's move back to those pandemics and address each one of them just briefly. The 1889-90 influenza pandemic, the first one that is clearly well documented. And this is a quote from a manuscript. The last true pandemic of the affection originated in Bukhara, which is in Central uh, Asia in May of 1889, reached St. Petersburg in the following October, Paris in November, London in December, crossed to America to appear in the middle of December, rapidly multiplied into an explosive epidemic, which reached its maximum in January of 1890. So it's hard to believe that it could spread that rapidly with no more transportation that was available in the world at that time. Influenza has an amazing ability to spread. And then there were interpandemic interval of epidemics. A suggestion of a change in the hemagglutinin took place in, uh, in 19, around 1899 or 1900, but a clear pandemic did not occur. The next one was swine in 1918, which was well known, in which in the U.S. the estimated number of deaths were 500,000. There are other estimates that are higher than that, approaching 700,000. Worldwide, 20 million, as I've indicated, the most devastating pandemic of history, and that rears its ugly head every time a question of an influenza pandemic arises. It had a unique age distribution for mortality in that half of the deaths occurred in individuals who were primarily healthy between the ages of 20 and 40. And this is a CDC-generated figure which demonstrates that. Here are 18892 age-related mortality from Massachusetts, showing the high young and the high elderly, and two after 1918 for the United States, and this unique figure that occurred from 1918, which at the present time remains unexplained. It was a devastating pandemic that perhaps can be emphasized and, and registered by just a, a few quick anecdotes. The medical apparatus was overwhelmed. I mean, space, doctors, nurses, everything. The med medicine could not care for the epidemic adequately. This shows the ambulance and the transportation of patients to the nearest site in which some care could be given. This is a, taken from an individual who worked in the Virginia Shipyard Corporation, a description at that time. We had been working three eight-hour shifts of labor around the clock. When the first blow hit us, caused by the strange influenza disease, when we found 26 men dead in our, their beds that first night shift, and still more sitting or down on the fever, on the floor with fevered lips. We tried, but not any of us know what to do for the stricken. It caused us mental anguish. That kind of story took place all over the country and all over the world during 1918. And it still survives today to haunt the annals of influenza. Uh, lots of things were attempted to try and prevent. How to avoid influenza, these children were gargling saline daily. The troops gargled saline. Some carried asphidita bags. I don't know how many of you know what an awful smell asphidita has around their necks to ward off evil spirits. It was great fear was taking place, and there perhaps were even some strange ideas about how the virus spread. Well, then the next one after again a series of interpandemic epidemics was Asian pandemic of 1957. It was recognized early as a new subtype and the World Health Organization surveillance network which had been set up prior to that proved its value and for the first time an influenza virus was clearly shown to cause a pandemic. This was perhaps the most studied, studied epidemic of any infectious disease up to that time. Influenza virus alone was shown to be capable of producing an extensive pneumonia without requiring a bacterial component, but mortality by age returned to the 1889 pattern of primarily in the very young and in the elderly. And this is the map of tracing of the spread of Asian influenza with its origin in China, its recognition first in Singapore and then Hong Kong, 
and spreading by transportation routes around the world in a fairly rapid order. In 1968, a major change occurred again that constituted the Hong Kong pandemic, recognized again by the way of the WHO surveillance network and the use of reassorting viruses. By this time, it was clearly known that this was a segmented, this virus had a segmented genome. And so you could reassort genes and pick out hemagglutinins or neuraminidase and other genes that you choose. And by doing that, it was clearly shown, clearly shown that there was a change only in the hemagglutinin and not in the neuraminidase. This one happened to be very infectious for lab workers, also uh, moved to swine as some of the other viruses have, and vaccine was available for clinical trials, clearly done up front for the first time. Now, if we take those epidemics and begin to do some comparisons, this is the kind of published data that's available. In 1889 pandemic, the rate per 100 for a population was 40 per 100 for the state of Massachusetts. There are a number of rates available for countries around the world. The majority of them varied between 30 and 50. 1918 swine influenza, a population study that was done by Frost, and the estimate was 29 per 100. Again, in 1957, a large population study, 24 per 100. And shown over here for comparison are two studies done by Tom Chin, who's with us today, and families in Kansas City, but they were drawn from the same population showing about the same attack rates. Well, I think while this one could have been higher, these are different methods, different times, different criteria. It's hard to take data like that and argue for there being a significant difference in the influenza attack rate between these initial pandemic waves. That's not true, however, when you consider mortality. 1889, the estimate was rate per 100,000 for the 1889 epidemic was 50. 41 for the Asian epidemic. There are other estimated rates available for each of these. Hong Kong 17, it appeared to be clearly a less virulent epidemic, perhaps partly because of the shared neuraminidase. But standing out here is the swine epidemic swine pandemic in which an estimated 500,000 deaths took place in an estimated population of 100 million and gave us a 500 per 100,000 rate. That stands out as distinctly unusual and again continues to haunt us. What do we know about where these arose? Well, we don't know all of them clearly. There's no question that 1957, 1968, and 1977 arose in Asia. The others are somewhat questionable. The first clear recognition, as we've indicated in 1889, was in Central Asia. There's information suggesting it was in China before that and information suggesting it was not in China before that. But it clearly was first recognized in uh, Central Asia. 1918 is the one that's least certain about where it came. And I put, should have put a question mark Asia here, but it clearly did not arise in Spain despite being called Spanish influenza. It may have arisen in Asia and there's a pot, that possibility exists also, other sites have been suggested. But the point of the slide is to indicate a reason for concern about events such as this that arise in Asia. And then we can't leave this subject without at least mentioning the swine flu affair that was occurred in 1976-77, in which the events were quite different. An influenza outbreak occurred at Fort Dix, New Jersey in January of 1976. There were five virus isolations of A swine-like viruses, eight other swine infections by serology, and one recruit death with the swine virus. But it did not move. Victoria became the dominant virus in that outbreak and became the dominant uh, infection throughout the country that given year. That remains with us as a consideration. So, there are a lot of questions you can ask about pandemic influenza, but let me just take three major questions. What is the origin of the pandemic? That is the primary one of consideration to epidemiologists and virologists. And also, why was the fatality rate in 1918 so high and why did it involve young adults? That remains to haunt us when we see pandemic as a threat. So what is the origin of these epidemics? Well, the most common and the most popular thesis at the present time is that they arise from bird viruses. 
You can see there are three humans that have viruses that have been described, and there's data suggesting a recapitulation of the humans, human hemagglutinin types, but it's not strong data for saying that they're still around. Swine, you can see, has two, equines three, they're different neuraminidase. But in the avian population, there have been now 15 hemagglutinins described that are distinct subtypes, including those that have been seen in other in mammals and nine neuraminidase subtypes. So the prevailing concept for which there's an extremely large amount of evidence is that the source of new hemagglutinins is the avian population. They are wild birds and primarily aquatic species. Now these are the migratory routes for birds. They went, they summer in the cool climates for, for water, the waterfowl for breeding. They go to different parts of the world at other times. And this is called the North American flyway. This is the Asian flyway. The Eurasian flyway to some extent has been studied, but these are the primary ones. And this is the one which Rob Webster's produced most of his data on. Dr. Guo in China and Kuda in Japan, most of the data from this site. But you can see there are viruses going down right across the area that we, I mean, birds going down right across the area that we have concern for. Well, let's consider that avian source for just a moment. The avian influenza virus reservoir. Transmission is fecal oral via contaminated water. The water in Alaska and lakes has been shown to contain virus. The water in pools in Memphis, Tennessee has been shown to contain virus. Infections are asymptomatic, and this would be a circumstance that would perpetuate a reservoir. Wild ducks infect the juveniles, but the maximum is 20%. So it lacks the population immunity that would be the pressure for selecting the antigenic drift variants which characterizes the human epidemiology. And multiple subtypes occur simultaneously. They're out there floating around with a lot of them giving us the opportunity to cross that species barrier. It's not inappropriate, I think, to consider these as influenza viruses, as natural infections of birds and particularly wild migratory waterfowl birds. That being the case, the unnatural host is man. And yet these viruses have developed the capability to survive in man. We're using the, techni the techniques and the genetic variation that we just talked about. But they are primarily avian viruses. Then what is some summary of the evidence for avian source of the human influenza A subtypes? Each human H and N has an avian counterpart, as we've indicated. Genetic analyses indicate each avian gene is older than the human counterpart. Avian genes do exhibit genetic conservation, which keeps them unchanged. Avian viruses can infect mammals. That's been shown experimentally, and it's been shown naturally. And now, as you see, it's been shown clearly to occur in man as well. There were anecdotal cases in the past. Now we've got an outbreak. Swine are permissive for both avian and human viruses, and it's been proposed that they constitute an intermediate host for gen genetic reassortment of this segmented genome where you can take the internal genes from human viruses to make good growth viruses that produce disease and new genes for the external glycoproteins to make unique subtypes. Then you've got the possibility of a pandemic. The data for that having occurred in 1957 and in 1968 is very strong. Not so strong for the others. And so there remains the possibility that it jumps straight across that species barrier. So co-circulation of influenza viruses occurs in humans, pigs, and in ducks in China. And that, with what we do know about these, has been proposed as the probable epicenter for the new pandemic strains. And here we are again back to the consideration of Asia as the site of part of the world to pay most attention for the generation of new pandemics. And then on that background, we had an episode in Hong Kong. This is from Time Magazine. When a mysterious and deadly flu virus struck Hong Kong last year, medical detectives from around the world fearing a repeat of the 1918 epidemic, see that's always haunts us, that killed more than 20 million sprang into action. This is the story of the flu hunters. And the detective was Keiji Fukuda, and maybe this is one of the EIS officers <laughs> participating in that particular trial that we just heard about a little bit ago. This also appeared in Time Magazine, and as I've already indicated, makes great press. 
Here's the 1918 pandemic. Here's 1918 and 1998, hypothesizing what could happen. See, the population is three times as great. The spread should be quicker. We do have vaccines and some drugs now, but the death rate 20 plus million in 1918 with no effect this might calculate out to 60 million now. And hence, we have that same concern each time a pandemic arises is that there might be another 1918. This is an early graph of the development of cases proven in the outbreak in Hong Kong. The second one in, 19, in November's two. The first one had been in the previous May. This shows you the epidemic curve. Two of these were proven and there were a total of 17 cases that occurred between November the 2nd and December the 28th. This slide summarizes that outbreak data. The first case occurred in May of 1997. The outbreak, as we've indicated, occurred November, December 1997. The viruses were proven to be avian H5N1 viruses and not reassortants considering at least viruses that would grow well and we might call human genes. The publication from the CDC by Dr. Sparrow and Dr. Cox's group was the first one that clearly rigorously demonstrated this was an avian virus. Since then, it's been clearly shown to be true for a number of the other strains. The cases were geographically separated in the Hong Kong province. The acquisition risk early was suggested for poultry exposure. I understand the preliminary readout on the case control study confirms this, but clearly minimal to no human-human spread occurred. That's where we stand on the outbreak knowledge. Clinically, there were 18 cases. All were recognized as hospitalized cases. Eight male, 10 female. Nine were under age six, nine over age six. The onset of all was febrile respiratory disease compatible with influenza. 10 developed pneumonia, and there were six deaths for a mortality, case fatality rate of 33 and 100, so 33%. That's unusually high. Then what was done to try and stop this? An import ban was placed on chickens from the mainland on December 23rd. One and a half million birds were slaughtered in Hong Kong between December 29 and 31, and no new cases occurred thereafter. It's hard to argue with the fact that slaughtering the chickens stopped the outbreak in Hong Kong. I think that's, that's very strong and very clear. Did it stop a pandemic threat? It's another matter. And to keep it that way, what they set up was enhanced poultry surveillance regulations in Hong Kong to different husbandry mechanisms to be sure that this marketplace contamination and spread does not occur again, and enhanced regulations to ensure that H5N1 chickens coming in from southern China primarily were free of H5N1. There's an estimated 75,000 chickens per day were coming in from South China to Hong Kong prior to the occurrence of this epidemic. And there have been no cases since then. But I have to remind you that the last case was December 28th. We're somewhat less than four months since then. There was six month interval between the first case and the second case. So let's think about this a little bit now. What are the options for H5N1 in Hong Kong chickens? That's what started this and appears to have accounted for it. Well, we go back to our strong current concept that migratory birds carry these viruses, and then the migratory bird would have been proposed to have deposited it in a Hong Kong chicken farm, and it spread from there. Or did a migratory barn give it, bird give it to a South China farm, and the South China farm imported it into Hong Kong? Or was it already in the Hong Kong chickens, which was suggested for the Maryland epidemic with H5 and the Mexico epidemic, and virulence developed at a later time due to both mutational changes. But in any case, that would mean a past introduction by these same roots, either here or here. Hence the focus and the concern for South China. Now, this is a map of South China. Here's Hong Kong. This is the Guangdong province, or the former Canton province. Guangzhou City or Canton City, <clears throat> and the bird flyway goes across this area. Well, it's clearly possible that a bird could have chosen to sit down in Hong Kong and produce that outbreak. But look at the number of opportunities that the bird had to sit down elsewhere. If we knew something about infection rates, the carriers, the sitting down rates, the risk, you know, we could say what the likelihood is of Hong Kong versus the South China site 
of having uh, acquired this infection from the migratory bird. But just intuitively, it seems that it's much more likely to have occurred in South China. Then what is the virus in, was the virus in Hong Kong chicken flocks or was it imported from China, main, Chinese mainland or if it came in from the mainland, then is human H5N1 influenza on the mainland? And to answer those questions, a World Health Organization team was formed to go to South China. Nancy Cox from here and I served as members of that team and that perked up my interest a good bit about this pandemic. And this is what we did in a fairly whirlwind fashion. We visited five provincial health and epidemic prevention station, five of the surveillance sites that were in, in Guangdong province and hospitals, two chicken farms, one poultry market, and an animal quarantine station that controlled shipments. And these are our findings. Human surveillance was in small scale in the past. It was increased by the Chinese in December of 19, of, of 97 and it was restricted to small numbers of individuals presenting to outpatient clinics. It did not include in-house hospital surveillance. We walked the, the hospital wards, we walked the clinic wards, we walked the epidemic, we walked the emergency room wards in these hospitals. The Chinese said that there is no epidemic and we agreed there's no ongoing epidemic in those hospitals in, in late January. They report no H5N1 cases having been identified. But it's also clear that the hospital physicians and the diagnostic studies that related to hospital patients were not sufficient to make a strong statement out of that. So we came away with a clear impression that while H5N1 has not been recognized, sporadic cases, which is what we're talking about here, could well have occurred and been missed. Now avian surveillance, was also sought here, but it was not our primary concern. It was reported to have been increased in 1994 when H9 was, in, was recognized in chicken flocks, H5N1 was isolated from a goose in 1996, and antibody was detected in some others, but the Chinese authorities reported no H5N1 infections or outbreaks in chickens. The data we had suggested that they had done a pretty good job of trying it's difficult when you're producing 1.1 billion chickens a year to be absolutely certain. So we remained convinced that it was possible even though it has not so far been recognized. So what was our recommendation? It was very clear. Increase the surveillance in South China and in make it of a pattern that would be looking for these viruses in humans and in animals. Now, I don't know what, we made very specific recommendations. I'm not repeating those to you. We don't know the result of that so far, but there have been no reports out of South China of recognition of H5N1 chicken outbreaks or of human cases. So now let's go back to our subject again. And is a pandemic a risk? Well, I, I, you should know before I even tell you, I'm not going to answer that question. But let's talk about the subject. What are the options for why H5N1 occurred in humans now? Well, one is it's not unique been missed in the past and the virus is unable to sustain itself in a human population. Or this was the first time episode, it was a unique episode and abnormal, but it is abortive and a one-time event. And in order for this to become a pandemic virus, we've got to have one of those reassortant events either in human or in a mammalian species such as swine to generate that human virus to then spread in human populations to produce the pandemic. So if killing the chickens stopped that outbreak, had they not been killed, would we have continued to have sporadic cases, we would continue to have the risk for this reassortment event. So while I don't agree with Dr. Webster that we can say a pandemic was prevented, theoretically it may well have been and certainly an outbreak was truncated. But on the other hand, we worry a little bit about what's known about 1918 and we know a lot about influenza viruses and they can acquire virulence properties after passage within mammalian host. In that case, the virulence properties of this might become a pandemic strain, and was this different, and therefore constituting a pandemic threat? If that's the case, then human-to-human -human transmission on some level would be required in order to make that change that makes it into a human virus and then spread. So what do we require for an influenza epidemic and pandemic? We require a virus with infection and illness potential a virus that can readily transmit a susceptible population 
and a constellation of contributing factors that you've only been poorly defined that we call winter factors and involve crowding, perhaps low humidity, perhaps some other factors as well. Well, let's think about that one-time event and put it up against a consideration of one we had previously in 1977 with swine and see what we get. Both produced human cases, swine in 1977, Hong Kong in 1998. In both cases, the population is highly susceptible, then and to H5. And in both cases, it proved to be an animal virus producing the outbreak, and as I've indicated, clearly an animal virus here. Swine viruses have the same genetic origin that human H1N1 viruses have, but biologically, the swine at this time is a swine virus and not a human virus. In both cases, minimal to no transmission has occurred. In swine in 1977, spread outside the localized area did not occur, and it was shown that this did not include, not have the characteristics of a new human pathogen. It remained a swine pathogen primarily. We have question marks here. So hence the importance of information from South China that is currently being generated, and the importance of biological data. I know some of which is being done by Rob Webster, to see if this virus is different than H5N1 viruses or other avian viruses that we've seen in the past. That information we'll have to wait for. And then we end up with our primary consideration again. Is this the beginning of a pandemic? For that would be that this is the first human and infectious disease outbreak with an H5N1 virus that has been recognized. We have a highly susceptible world population. It emerged in Hong Kong in Asia, and we have to concede it may exist on the mainland. It's possible that H5N1, in this case, constitutes a new human pathogen. Against this, however, is that they are pure avian viruses. Pure avian viruses are not human viruses, and this one's already shown its reduction in ability to spread. Little to no human-human transmission resulted. And no cases occurred after the chicken slaughter. If we can take this fact and this fact and move them down here, which should take place over the next several months, I think we can develop a great deal of reassurance that we are not at the beginning of a pandemic. At the present time, however, we cannot do that. And the second concern that I had for us was, is virulence increased? Is it like 1918? And for this is that all recognized cases were hospitalized primary viral pneumonia appeared to be common. There was a high mortality rate, and in three out of the six deaths, there was no recognizable underlying disease. Those are the characteristics uh, that, are, that, that, that describe pandemic influenza in early ways. Against it, however, is that there was no trend for early hospital admission. This rapid, severe disease that results in early hospital admission, which characterized 1957 and 68 very clearly, and anecdotally described for 1918. The population attack rate is uncertain. We can't judge virulence without having a denominator. And if you take the Houston data on hospitalizations death ratios and use that as the basis for an expected and the observation of deaths here, they are not significantly different. So without a denominator saying that we had an increased case uh, load to the hospitals and deaths, we can't say for sure whether there's a difference in virulence or not. That would require serial survey. I thought one was being conducted, but I, actually I think it probably should not be. If you take our figures again, do the calculations, then you'd say there are 18,000 cases in the 6 million people in Hong Kong. That would be extraordinarily difficult to find in a serial survey. So again, we're in a waiting proposition of whether this virus is going to move and become a pandemic threat or disappear as an abortive episode. As we've said, there have been four months that have gone by since the first recognized case. In six months, I think we would begin to relax a little bit, but if that is, has with it strong surveillance data out of South China in both chickens and humans of no H5N1 into the summer and fall, then the likelihood is very low. However, I don't think any of us are willing to say short of a year from now that that was behind us and that a pandemic threat has not taken place. Now, on the other hand, 
we thought we knew a lot about what does influenza. And then this caught my attention in an article recently in the newspaper by Robert Grove at a conference taking place on the El Nino in Canberra, Australia, in which it was said that the crop failures in France, which were attributable to El Nino, contributed to the social unrest that led to the French Revolution. There was an increase in the rodent population with El Nino that led to Black Death. And this one was not well explained, but the statement was made that most influenza pandemics between 1557 and 1900 were associated with El Nino. And need I remind you that this year has been an El Nino year. <laughs> well, again, thank you for inviting me. It's always tough, fun to talk about influenza. It's a pleasure to be with you.